We have our own uh, uh, Vivek uh, Srinivasan. Um, Vivek, as you all know, uh, runs the CDRL Liberation Technology Program. Um, he has a background in the politics of food in India, including three different uh, books on uh, the politics of food in India. Uh, but he's also been an activist, an activist and a scholar. And we are celebrating today the publication of a brand new book. There it is. Uh, <laughs> Delivering Public Services Effectively, Tamil Nadu and Beyond. And uh, this is great. This is terrific. So congratulations. Thank you. And uh, it's all yours. Thank you. So... <clears throat> So Larry, with his ample time on his hand, decided that he wanted this talk to be recorded since he's not here. So whenever you watch it, Larry, I have no idea how, how you manage the time. <laughs> so, so thank you all for coming and thank you, Steve and Serena, for organizing this. It's uh, wonderful to be able to present this work. <clears throat> what I thought I'll do, since it's a friendly audience, um, is that I won't focus so much on what I did in the book per se, but there were elements that um, I did not focus on so much in writing the book that I feel like um, could be developed and maybe presented in future works. That's what I wanted to tease on a little bit um, in today's talk. So part of the motivation for this is that um, those of you who have been following uh, politics in India would know that there are increasing murmurs about um, change, uh, dramatic improvements in governance of all kinds of basic public services um, like schools and roads and provision of electricity, healthcare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This substantial improvement um, in how things function state after state after state. Um, there were places, um, uh, for those of you who know the North Indian state Bihar, where if you told people about 10 or 15 years back that this state could improve and uh, provide better roads or eliminate crime, nobody would have believed you. But things change quite dramatically. In fact, the state of crime, for example, in that uh, place, especially in urban areas, <laughs> dropped down quite dramatically within a matter of three or four years, um, completely changing the nature of nightlife and just people's ability to walk in the evenings uh, with a feeling of safety and whatnot. So in that sense, there's a feeling of uh, things improving across, and that's one of the themes that I wanted to touch upon. But what I'll mostly do is to talk a little bit about the background of one particular state um, called Tamil Nadu, which is in southern India, which has a fantastic track record of providing all kinds of basic public services like childcare, uh, basic health, uh, schooling, uh, access to roads, access to transport, access to electricity, water, etc., etc. Any village I went to in the state, you would find that all of these services are available and they tend to function remarkably well. And the impact it has on human development is, is quite dramatic. So for example, if you take something like maternal mortality, there's a difference of three to four folds between a state like this and some of the worst states in the country. So similarly with uh, life expectancy, there have been fairly dramatic improvements over a period of the last 30 to 40 years. Um, there have been Im uh, remarkable improvements in uh, maternal mortality, infant mortality, um, and quite a bit of other figures that one could think about. The way I got into this is, as Steve mentioned, I was an activist um, in India working on what was called the Right to Food campaign, where the campaign was demanding uh, school feeding and improvement in childcare facilities across the country. So we would do these demonstrations in different parts of the country, mostly in North India, where the facilities tend to be very abysmal, with very little traction. And then when I went back home to meet my parents, uh, not so much to do my work, I would stumble into the villages where I started seeing that the schools were so well functional, the child care center was so functional, that I started becoming curious as to why the state developed that kind of commitment to provide basic public services. As I started reading literature, one thing became very clear. Nobody talked about the state as being a model. The one state that has been singled out in, um, in talking about India has been Kerala, which many of you might know of the famous Kerala model uh, where the state was able to have very dramatic improvements on human development uh, indicators with relatively low levels of uh, industrial development, uh, basically by providing ba public services. So Kerala has a distinct political history. Among other things, it's the first uh, region in the world to have an elected communist government. 
um, which happened in, in 1958. And since then, the communists have been in and out of power on a regular basis. And the communist movement, even when they're not in power, is a very powerful grassroots movement that's constantly mobilizing people, and the trade unions and the state are very powerful. So because Kerala was uniquely successful in creating this very early on in India, um, people had labeled it as a unique model and attributed that to communism in the state. And later on, um, this another state called West Bengal, which is in India's east, had did impressive land reforms, again spearheaded by the Communist Party, which came to power in the 1970s. So a lot of uh, I mean, people working on comparative politics, I mean, people like Atul Kohli and Patrick Heller have attributed uh, improvements, progressive improvements in a state mainly to uh, left, uh, I mean, left of center mobilization. Tamil Nadu did not have that kind of mobilization. It does have a presence of the communist parties, but it does not have a very strong presence of the communist parties. And they've never been in power, and except for the very first election after independence, they have never been a serious contender as well. And unlike Kerala and West Bengal, which had a certain amount of land reforms happen, uh, Tamil Nadu focused mainly on providing public services. So starting with the second chief minister of India, who was trying to argue between the left and the right, um, basically he argued with the left saying, look, you want land reforms, but it's a very, uh, the only way to get there is uh, violent. You, you cannot get land reforms without creating a lot of conflict in the society. And he would argue with the right, saying that, look, you may want lower taxes and greater industrialization, but if we have a democracy without the state doing anything for the majority, then <clears throat> the system will not be sustainable. So he was able to build a compromise where his vision of development was to provide public services in a very large fashion as a way of achieving human development. Now, interestingly, neither the left nor the right, right likes it. The right tends to say that this is a terrible policy because it's going to increase fiscal deficit um, and reduce growth. The left says that these are not structural reforms, so it's not going to lead to development. So most people who have studied Tamil Nadu have traditionally said that the politics in the state is dysfunctional <laughs> because it provides public services really well. Um, so by just even changing the value basis of my work, I start looking at Tamil Nadu's politics in a very different perspective, and that in itself is one of the contributions that I make through the study. Um, but So that's something that I cover at length um, in the book as to why uh, that commitment came into being, uh, some of which I'll cover in today's talk. One other thing that I discovered in the, pa in the process of doing my 13-month long work in Tamil Nadu, but also a 15-year long work on public services, in different parts of India is that there is a certain pattern, a very discernible pattern to programs that work well. Um, and I'm going to use the metaphor of um, design-centered thinking to explain that particular pattern as we go along. Let me start with an example of one particular program and illustrate the difference between Tamil Nadu and other states. Um, so it's the child care center in, um, in India. It's governed by a program called the Integrated Child Development Services which has the philosophy that you want one center, which is called as the Anganwadi, where all the different services should be to be provided to children under six. So if you just look at some very basic um, differences um, in terms of infrastructure in a survey that we did across six states, um, most Anganwadis in Tamil Nadu would have a proper building, would have kitchen, storage facilities, um, toilets, etc., etc. Very basic things that a center should have. And if you look at the comparison with the traditional, I mean, typical North Indian state on the right, the difference is quite stark, very, very, very stark. And even if you look at the number of hours that a childcare center is open, uh, the difference is almost twice. So what ends up happening in most of North India is that the childcare centers tend to be feeding centers where children come for a short while, get some food, and go back. Whereas um, in Tamil Nadu, they had a fantastic uh, early childhood education program. Uh, with very well-trained workers operating it. Um, but there's one particular thing that I want to actually I mean, uh, take on a little bit more in detail, which is the average month since training of the workers. This is a, pan, uh, it's a national program with a common guideline for all the states. One aspect of the guideline is that the childcare workers should be trained for 15 days uh, every second year. Now, if you look at the average level of training, that doesn't quite happen um, in most states. Whereas if you look at Tamil Nadu, the average uh, months since training is actually only six. 
And what I was very surprised to find out is that this difference happened with exactly the same budget. And this is how they did it. So they recognized in Tamil Nadu, it's most, it's a, the training system in itself is run by women, almost completely by women. And they recognized that <coughs> if you ask childcare workers who are often um, very low paid women with very heavy domestic uh, commitments, to go to a state center to have their training every two years, I mean for 15 days, most of them are not in a position to do so. So they said, using exactly the same budget, it's possible for me to create a training team in every block, uh, which is uh, like a county, which is a sub-district unit. So women can come to the training center in the morning and go back home in the evening. So they would only train the trainers at the state level. And they were able to create three trainers who will be parked in every county um, throughout the year. So after training, uh, they can actually go and visit the workers in order to retrain them throughout the year. And remarkably, they achieved it with practically the same budget. <laughs> One other thing that happened is that in the early phases of the Integrated Child Development <coughs> Services, there was a lot of pressure on the government um, from many experts who said, you know, let's create a targeted program. Let's identify uh, the most deserving pockets or the most deserving kids. Whereas the chief minister at that point of time had a, wanted to send a message that he wanted to work for the commitment of all. So he very firmly said that I will not listen to experts in terms of what kids get enrolled in this program. Every child should be able to access the program. Whereas he made it clear that he wanted the help of experts in designing the pedagogy, designing the food that's served and everything else. So there was a combination of pedagogy, politics and creative thinking that went into making the program as functional as it is. So I'm talking about just one aspect of a complex program, but similar creative thinking has gone into so many other elements. Um, into making the program what it is. I'll uh, build on it as we go along. So another thing that I generally found out is that if you look at the design of the programs, um, generally you start with a, a, some kind of a template, you know, some kind of a common parameter that you implement um, across the state. But then there's no program that can be designed for a complex geography, for a large geography, that will work equally well everywhere. So there was feedback that used to constantly happen, and the program would be revised. So in any uh, case, in, in any single case that you look at, there's a constant revision of the programs in form of what are called as government orders, which are these rules that are inserted. Often these rules are very minor, like how much petrol can be spent um, by each official um, to monitor the program, uh, how many hours should be spent in uh, monitoring the program, who should go at what time. So it's often the deep. <coughs> The rules are very, very detailed. They micro-regulate the system. And they evolve constantly. They evolve all the time. And typically in response to feedback from the ground. To give you one example, there's a workfare program in the country where any person uh, living in rural areas across India can ask for work from the government, and they should be given work within 15 days. It's called the Employment Guarantee Act. So the rule of the program is that you work in casual manual labor, so you do hard physical work in digging check dams or doing afforestation and other kind of work, and you get paid minimum wages. So the idea is that only families that have no fallback come to this kind of work, so it's a major form of social security, similar to what happened in the New Deal era through Civilian Conservation Corps, except that there's an element of guarantee here. Is it all over India? or? It's all over India. So when it got implemented, so one of the things they said is that we want to make sure that people just don't turn up to work, do nothing, and then get paid. So they said we will calculate the amount of work a person working diligently for seven hours should do, and we will pay them according to the task they did. But in calculating the work, so let's say one of the major things that people do is to dig earth because a lot of uh, uh, I mean, work to do with afforestation, water management, etc., involves digging and transportation of mud and working with land. So they took the rates from the public works de department, which is involved in this kind of work constantly. But in the public works department, people, people typically work along with machines. So you have blasters, you have tractors that transport things, etc. In the Employment Guarantee Act, that's not allowed. So which means that the per capita productivity will be much higher for a laborer in the public works department. So if you say that a person working in, uh, you take the example of public works department and set the wage rate for an NRE, in the Employment Guarantee Act, it's not going to work. So they started the program, there were protests immediately, and they had to revise the wages, and they did it twice until people were satisfied that you could actually earn the minimum wage. 
So like this, there were so many other changes within the one year that I was there. There were 60 different government orders that were passed that tweaked different elements of the system in response to feedback from the ground. To take another example, um, so the in order to provide water, they started installing overhead tanks in many villages. Now it turns out that if you need to pump water all the way up, they have to have multiple electricity connections for the motors. And the way they typically do it is to use what are called as multiple phases of electricity. In rural India, what happens is that you apportion electricity to different parts of the village in different parts of the day. So some phases get electricity at one point, other phases don't, so you ration electricity that way. So if you have three phases of electricity being used for overhead tank, you will never be able to pump water up or you'll be able to do it at short durations. So someone said, let's ignore the overhead tanks and let's start creating what are called mini tanks that can work with one motor with a simple one phase electricity. So these are you know, often very common sense, very simple solutions. But these solutions, when you constantly reiterate a program with it, have enormous consequences for how things work. Um, and these changes happen not just at, in, over a short period of time. In most programs that have been functional, these changes have been happening for decades. So when you start a program, it may not be as I mean, very, very functional, but over a period of time, the level of functionality becomes increasing, I mean, extreme, exceedingly remarkable. Um, to give you one final example, so I was talking to uh, interviewing the commissioner of the public distribution system where Tamil Nadu's performance is remarkably better than most other states. And he gave an overview of what problems they took up over, uh, I mean, over a period of 15 years. He started by saying that the first problem that we wanted to tackle was the availability of ration shops close to home. So we made sure that there is one shop, which is the shop which sells subsidized food grains, within two kilometers of walking distance of every household. But in case there is a, a, let's say, a river or some kind of a barrier for you to access it, we will ha relax the two kilometer norm. We did that for five years and we improved access. After that, we started focusing on other problems. So one major problem is that the dealers who uh, vend the grain would often tell people, your grain has not come, so I can't give it to you. And they would siphon the grains and sell it in the market. So they said, if I start issuing coupons to people, um, independent of the dealers, so they started getting school teachers and they would get all the people on one day and give them coupons for a whole year. So when you go to the ration shop, you give the coupon and get your grains and the ration dealer gets compensated only when he presents the coupon to the government. So this created an incentive for the dealer not to tell people I don't have grains. So again, like, uh, and then finally they said the next five years we realized that the coupon system was working but there was under measurement of services. So we started packaging sugar, we started packaging uh, rice and other things with seal so that they don't measure on the spot. And they started doing a series of other measures, I mean, uh, taking measures to make sure that the under measurement issue is taken care of. So in that sense, these improvements also happen over a long period of time, which uh, today when I look back at what the, uh, how the system works, it is very, very remarkable. But it's a system that has evolved in response to problems from the ground in response to uh, the different complexities of administering a program over a tremendous period of time. So basically what I'm saying is that even a very well created program, so typically when a bureaucrat sets out to create a, um, a program, they do put a lot of thought into it. They do put a lot of energy into it. But even when you implement a well, I mean a sophisticated idea in a very complex area, things often don't work. So you need an iterative process, you need feedback, you need constant improvement over a period of time to meet the complex realities. So it's useful to kind of think about this using the metaphor of design thinking, which was popularized by the design school here at Stanford. Um, let me go through some of the bubbles before I come back to it. So one idea being, uh, so, so basically the design thinking metaphor in some sense came in response to the idea that a lot of engineers tried to create the perfect model um, in your mind and then you start developing software or other designs to accommodate that model. But then once you start implementing something that you put so much effort into, uh, they often fail and tweaking them becomes difficult. So the model here starts by saying that one of the things you need to do to begin with is to uh, empathize, which is to basically understand the different users in your system. A common sense thing but often doesn't happen because we think of uh, an expert way of developing things is a complete, I mean, it's often very different. Once you have, uh, let's say, a, an understanding of the context and different users, 
create what is called as the point of view, which is what are the different ways uh, in which you can write the problem statement. And based on the problem statement, you come up with creative ideas. Don't do, let's say, a survey which looks at the best implementation in different places, but also give space for creative ideas in order to respond to issues. And then create rapid prototypes and test the system. Uh, but most importantly, make sure that it's not a linear model that you do one of I mean, these things one by one next to other. There's a lot of conversation that happens between, let's say, observation. You may start ideating, creating, com I mean, coming up with creative ideas, but you may want to go back and observe and change or tweak your ideas and whatnot. So it's this recursive, messy process has very significant consequences to how things work. And that metaphor is, I find uh, it very useful to understand not just how things work in Tamil Nadu, but when I, when I look at different programs that have started functioning very well in other parts of India, the same process happens. I mean, I want to single out two different programs here. One is the National the Employment Guarantee Act in a state called Andhra Pradesh, which has done remarkably well in implementing it, making sure that people get their wages on time, that people are able to get work on time, and in reducing corruption over a period of time. And what was very remarkable in the state is that um, in 2004, there was a similar food for work program implemented in the same state with an enormous amount of corruption that um, it, it is, I mean, uh, said that you know, a lot of tractors got bought by middlemen who were involved in the program uh, upon the end of the program, whereas very few laborers got any work. So starting from an, a den of corruption, they were able to change the program into a highly functional program that actually delivers services to people in reality. When you sit in the office uh, of the secretary who is the person in charge of governing the program, it's an incredible feeling. I mean, the amount of energy that they have and the amount of debates that they have and the constant back and forth that they have, is just unbelievable. And the same pattern that I found in Tamil Nadu also worked here. There was a constant iteration of programs, so they have had almost a, a thousand government orders regulating different aspects of the program. And in this particular case, they focused a lot on e-governance as well. So as a friend of mine put it, apart from passing a government order, they'll also keep sending software patches every week because a software patch regulates who can do what. So the use of patches and orders and other tweakings constantly has been very instrumental. Another case of a program that did not function well that improved dramatically is the public distribution system in a state called Chhattisgarh. So this state is a predominantly <coughs> tribal state which used to be a part of a larger state earlier. And it was divided um, in, uh, in the early two, in the mid-2000s, after which the political dispensation changed quite a bit and they started focusing on the public distribution system among other things. So when I spoke to the administrators, they said, okay, we identified that there's a lot of corruption in the program, but a lot of it happens at one point, which is when the, uh, when the transit happens between the warehouses where we store the grains to the places, uh, in, to the village, in, uh, to the shop where it's sold, that's where a lot of corruption happens. So they said in order to solve this problem, we said we will remove all the private truck dealers who are involved in carrying these grains because most of these guys are politically connected and they get the contracts in the first place by paying a lot of bribes, so let's eliminate them from the system because there's moral hazard in just how they are picked. And they also said we will do something interesting, which is to paint all these uh, new trucks in a distinct yellow color. So if any citizen sees that particular truck parked in a place where it should not be, they can call the call center and say, this guy is doing some hanky panky. <laughs> so it's a very simple idea, but think of how powerful it is to create transparency. And they created an online tracking mechanism. Um, interestingly, they, uh, they were forced to hire um, private consultants, I mean, some big name uh, consultancies to begin with, uh, to talk about their software, who said, you know, we need to digitize the entire system. They threw them out, and then they did it in-house. And they said, we will focus on only one element of digitization to begin with, the trucks going from the warehouse to the ration shop. So upon digitizing it, they were able to monitor the movement of trucks in a real-time manner, but they also said that every truck that reaches the village should send an SMS saying, I reached this village with so much grains. That will go to a central server, and any citizen who wants to subscribe to the service will get an immediate alert saying a truck has reached your village with so much grains. Then if you go to your shop and the dealer says, we don't have any grains, we have not got the supply, you know that you're being told the, I mean, it's, it's false. 
So it's often um, really simple ideas like these, very common sense ideas if you think about it in some sense, but creative and in response to contextual problems that underlie the rapid improvements in programs that I see in every part of the country that I've had an opportunity to go to. What it illustrates in some sense is that there is a huge room for improvement in how programs function, often with just the existing resources, in response to creative problem solving. But it also raises the question as to why does it happen in so few programs. So that's some insight I was able to get in Tamil Nadu's case. Um, while I was sitting in um, various government offices doing my ethnographic work for a period of about 13 months. So if you look at the life of a bureaucrat, they have so many different things to do typically that there are enormous competing demands on their time. And they also have very few incentives to do things well because you don't get rewarded if you actually implement a program really, really well. Under this condition, there's a strong reason for you not to implement a program well because if you don't, if no, there are not too many takers, it's much less work for you. That's really the incentive that actually drives you. And it's easier in some sense for uh, contractors and people with political connections and people with money bags to approach people in the administration to make them do things that you want. But for when it comes to public services for the common person, most common people often don't have the ability to influence people in positions of power. Interestingly, what I started observing as I started sitting in meetings uh, within these uh, public offices is that it was just full of debates. Say so every time a block office, which is the county office, would have meetings with the panchayat presidents who are elected uh, presidents at the village level, it was intensely full of fights. Often the presidents would come and tell them, look, you asked me to implement this program, but it is unworkable. So when I go and implement this in my village, all I get is bad name. And if I get bad name, I will not be elected next time. If you do it in such a way that it does not reach most people in my village, I'm going to create enemies. So in fact, uh, one thing that all the presidents constantly told me is that um, if, you, if you, let's say, have a village of 1,000 people and you create a program for just 100, the other 900 are going to stand against you the next time. So each president had a share of what they would call as their enemies. Um, it's a commonly used word. I'm not inventing it here. Um, so if the, 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 the way the enemies operated politically, I mean, often these are politically ambitious young men, is to foment <coughs> trouble with people who did not get benefits of a particular program. So when the next election comes, if you cater to a small section or if you badly implemented a particular program, you really stand to lose. That created pressure to constantly modify these rules. So they would often come and say, look, if you ask people to come to, let's say, the Employment Guarantee Act at 9 in the morning, it's not going to work. Uh, Tamil Nadu is a very hot place, and people turn to agricultural work at 6 in the morning. That's when it's more pleasant to work. So let's ask people to come at 6 in the morning, take a break in the afternoon, and come back. That's how we do it. So it's often these small things that they would put intense pressure to make sure that those are changed, because otherwise they can't show their face back in the villages. And like I said, there's a pressure also to universalize benefits, to make sure that it reaches the largest section of the population and not to a narrow section within. And together, these very small tweaks that they made had a huge, profound influence on nature of governance overall. And, and the term that they often used is people are uncontrollable. So when you have to deal with beneficiaries of different programs, you tell them you need to do this, and they'll say, I won't do that. That doesn't make sense. So um, some time back, which I'll come to again, they... They were presidents were powerful enough to tell people, you shut up and this is what you need to do. That's not possible anymore. So every president would control, I mean, complain saying these people are uncontrollable. Like, if I don't do what they want me to do, then I'm going to be in soup. So that uncontrollability of people was a huge vehicle to make sure that even if you don't empathize and understand their context, they make sure that you understand their context. And there was also incessant public action. So a lot of interaction with the panchayat presidents and other officials <coughs> happened on a day-to-day -day level. But there was also a lot of pub collective action that happened typically within the village level. Um, when I interviewed social movement leaders or actually I mean, village level leaders, so they would often tell me that you know we got 100 meters of road by fighting uh, one year. Another year we fought and we got 20 I mean, uh, street lights. Another year we fought and we got a, a water tank. So it's, it's by fighting and fighting and fighting that you actually get these public services to your village in the first place, especially the where the marginalized people tend to live. And the, it's the same process that also makes sure that these systems are functional. 
So there's a lot of collective action that takes place. I mean, this is a huge focus on the book, which I uh, won't go into today. But what was also interesting is that these episodes of collective action lasted for at least 20 or 30 years in most villages that I went to. So it's because of this small improvements that happened over such a long period of time that you have a dramatic change in how the state functions today. And the people who are engaged in collective action were also often sources of the creative inputs. Uh, telling I mean, officials, um, giving ideas to them on how to reframe a program so that it, it is actually functional in their own context. So what they ended up doing was to create pressure, um, as I was saying earlier, uh, for the officials to empathize with their context, even if the officials were not inclined to do so. So the design thinking metaphor in some sense assumes that you are empathetic and you really want to do it, <laughs> but that need not happen within the government <coughs> program, but pressure from below made sure that that it happened. It also made sure that points of view of people from different communities, from different geographies, from different occupations were taken into account. And so the programs implemented by governments started changing to meet the complex realities. And they also made sure that they put enough pressure on the officials to come up with creative solutions, often supplying these creative solutions themselves, all of which together have led to what happened in that particular state. What was also very remarkable for me is like by this time um, I started realizing the intensity of public action in the state. I mean, there's, there are lots of murmurs about it in the literature. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of agreement that there is, let's say, high level of awareness in Tamil Nadu, political awareness in Tamil Nadu, and there have been large social movements in the past. But it was not clear to me as to why that happened. So why is it there's a high level of collective action and public action in the state compared to most other parts of India? And one insight um, helped me start um, going towards it, which is that while people said um, universally agreed, whether they were an official or an activist or a journalist or a common citizen, they all agreed that that incessant action in the state mattered to how the state performed. But almost everybody said that it's a new phenomenon. It really dates back to the 1960s at the most. When I talked to the elders, most of them would say that we were too afraid to enter a police station. We were too afraid to talk to a uh, village president. We would never talk to the district collector or other administrators. So when you're too afraid even to enter a particular office, there's no way that you could actually bring your problems uh, in how programs function so that the government can adopt to it. And many panchayat presidents conversely said, I wish I were a president 30 years back because I didn't have to face all the uncontrollability of the people today. So therein lies an interesting um, question because what is it that changed in the nature of collective action? What made people take up this action in the state um, around this time? And that also gives us insights into looking at the rest of India shortly. Um, the question of why collective action changed in the state, I mean, can be answered in so many different frames. So I'll do an arbitrary division of internal and external changes and I'll do a summary view today. So one is that there was an increasing amount of income, education, and other capabilities among people, even in marginalized communities. This has different sources. So one source is that when the Indian constitution was promulgated, it said that uh, people of scheduled caste who are Dalits or ex-untouchables, um, and tribal people who tend to be the most marginalized uh, of the communities across India should be given 25% of all the public employment. And all the seats in educational institutions should be reserved for them about 25%. That got implemented well because of prior mobilization of these communities in the state. And so in village after village, you often find one person you know, who goes to school because his mother was able to fight and able to enroll them in school. They then get some kind of a low level job in the government, often as a police constable or as a clerk or often um, and other kinds of jobs. But this income enabled them to um, send their brothers and sisters to school who often came back with the capability to lead others in the village um, into the collective action of the sort that we saw. So in village after village, if you look at the uh, set of leaders, especially starting from the 70s, they tend to be young men with some level of education. Very often they had uh, diplomas or some of them had graduate degrees, uh, but there were many others who had at least, you know, I mean a primary school or a high, I mean a higher secondary school education, and that made a huge difference. Tamil Nadu is also among the most urbanized of Indian states, uh, it's among the large states. So what ends up happening is that in the earlier dispensation, the main person who puts pressure on you and keeps you in a, in a life fear is your landlord. The landlord can not only deny you employment, but they can also make sure that you have no house to live in. 
uh, this uh, regime of violence that they can unleash on you. So for example, for very minor questions that people would ask, uh, there were many forms of punishment uh, in the state where you could be tied to a tree and flogged with a reinforced rope. Uh, many people have repeated being ostracized or their huts being burnt for often small infractions, for small questions that they asked. That's that. So in that kind of a condition, you cannot really r raise questions against the person who gives you employment. Urbanization made it possible for people who wanted to raise pesky questions to go and work in a different place and have a different employer. And that also made a huge difference in their ability to start asking questions and to be assertive as well. Along with that, the state had a series of social movements uh, starting from the 1850s that created movement organizations uh, for different uh, communities uh, within. Now, a lot of people have written about social movements in uh, Tamil Nadu as being uh, huge and pervasive and whatnot. But what I found out is that most of these movements would have a presence in each district. But within any given district, there may be a few families that are active in it. There could be a particular march or there could be a particular event in which a lot of people will assemble. But for the most part, it's actually a few families that actually are active on a day to day basis. What they did was to provide the leadership and imagination for others when they started asserting themselves. And that makes a huge difference. To give you a quick example, um, one young man, when he wanted to start mobilizing people in this village, was told by a, uh, an elder that if you want to start raising contentious issues to begin with, it's not going to work. So he helped him create a campaign on controlling mosquito bites. So he went to the government and uh, they started doing spraying of pesticides and other things to control the mosquito population because mosquitoes bite the elite as well as the common person. <laughs> So once he did that, he got a certain semblance of organization. Then he fought for a bus to come to their locality on a regular basis. But by within two or three years, he had enough support and credibility that he was able to take up more contentious issues. And within five years, he fought to become the president of his village. So in that sense, the kind of guidance that you have from uh, networks, um, I'm giving one example, but the kind of support that you can get from such support networks is enormous. And finally, there is also uh, a unique phenomenon that happened in Tamil Nadu, which is uh, the use of cultural tools, unlike it has happened in any other case that I know of. Many of the social movement leaders um, in the early 1800s and, uh, I'm sorry, late 1800s and the uh, early 1900s were amazing orators. Um, so the number of people who would just converge to look at them is just enormous. Um, one of the greatest social movement leaders called Periyar uh, was also very imaginative in creating spectacles that would bring a large number of people to just think and reframe their imagination. And many of them were also fantastic songwriters, so they went into <coughs> movies. So today, most politicians in the state, barring one, has all been uh, involved in the movie industry. Uh, but what is interesting is that they're not uh, the Ronald Reagans of the movie industry who's acting in a traditional movie, but they're all political characters. So if you look at uh, these characters, they're all characters who stand for affirmative rights, who stand for bravery, who stand for, they all appeal to a call to people to become braver and to take up issues against I mean, uh, injustice. And this also had a huge consequence because a lot of people who under the circumstances may not be willing to take up a fight, get motivated by listening to this. And, and, and it's not isolated because the biggest movie stars in the state were all involved in this and movies are huge, huge, huge in my state. Um, and there's oratory, there are magazines that are published, and there's this constant bombardment of ideas and of wanting to reframe the society. And that also had a consequence, on one hand, among dominated communities to rise up, but on the other hand, among traditional oppressors to say, look, what we are doing is not correct. Um, to have one very quick illustration, so one of my interviewees, um, came back to his village after many years, and uh, one of the traditional bans on the untouchables uh, of many things that they're not allowed to do was to wear pants um, or cover the upper part of their body in presence of an upper caste person. So he said, you know what, I'm going to wear pants and walk around my village. So when somebody else remarked, look at this guy, the worker of a coolie who is daring to wear pants, when a person from upper caste itself told him, what's wrong with that? So let's temper things and let's just go on with life because he should have equal rights as with us. So this form of um, change among traditionally dominant communities, often due to cultural movements, also facilitated conflicts and reduced the level of conflicts that happened in the process of change overall. 
So along with these internal changes, there were also external changes among the most important of them being the introduction of adult franchise, uh, which happened with the first election in 1952 in India. Now, we all know that introduction of adult franchise doesn't mean that people have equal right to vote or equal ability to influence politics, but in conjunction with increasing organization and assertion, people were able to use the political framework very effectively. The, the organization along with franchise also has led to political competition that was intense from the state from the very first election. And competition in turn means that uh, the elected representatives or the political hopefuls are much, much more responsive to your demands when you're organized. Um, I did talk about urbanization earlier, and along with this, there was a diminishing power of landlords. So the south, southern part of India did not have very large landlords traditionally, uh, compared to um, landlords of the north, uh, who would often hold thousands of acres. Uh, the landlords here were much smaller, but even their children started migrating to cities because they got educated and they were looking for industrial jobs. When you don't live in the village, you don't have the same ability to dominate others. Um, so thus, the migration of I mean, um, the landlords and their children also meant that the force of dominance started reducing within the state. So these internal and external changes together meant that it was a lot easier to mobilize, that you won't be penalized, you won't be beaten up, you won't be ostracized and so on, and that you have a greater ability to <laughs> assert yourself um, in the current context. So let me now shift beyond, uh, beyond Tamil Nadu, which was the promise I made to begin with. There is a very palpable sense today um, that there is a change in the nature of governance across the country. As I said, Kerala has been the traditionally, uh, uh, has been the state that everybody has looked up to as a great performer. The dynamics that happened in Kerala of social reform, of increasing personal assertion, of increasing political competition, etc., are all very similar to what happened in Tamil Nadu, except that it predated Tamil Nadu by 20 years. And what is happening increasingly is that in states that have been traditionally very poorly governed, the same social changes have been happening. So um, the first backward caste party came to power in uh, Tamil Nadu in 1967, but they were a political force <laughs> even from 1952, the first election of India. Whereas in North India, it said that Dalits uh, in many states were not even able to vote until the 1990s. So it's the 1990s that assured a major shift from the power of upper caste into the backward caste, um, as far as holding of the government is concerned. But along with this, there have been many significant social changes at the locality, at the, at, in terms of day-to-day -day life. So today you might find a, a person of an ex-untouchable caste standing up and, I mean, not bothering to stand up when an upper caste person passes through him. This may be a simple... Uh, this may look like nonsense, but it actually has huge symbolic consequences for every single aspect of bargaining that you have in the society. So those kinds of changes also means that today the government cannot um, cater to a small section of the population and get away with it. So increasingly you find that state after state after state, they are creating programs, they are creating things that um, improve the well-being of the masses, of the common person, and thus start getting some support for re-election. Um, so I won't get into specific examples here for want of time. So this, these observations have a lot of, I mean, have, have interesting implications for uh, both theory and practice. So if we talk about policy, there's a huge debate in the country since the 1990s as to whether public services should be provided at all in a very, in, in an increasingly new, liberal context. One thing that every single advocate talks about is that we don't have public services are great, but we should not provide them because they don't reach people. Increasingly, what is happening is that the level of corruption is reducing in these public services. The effectiveness of the services is increasing year after year in state after state. So there is a greater case for us to actually deliver them. And the nihilism that ha exists around the provision of public services is actually quite unfounded today. The other uh, factor is that it's, it's important to recognize that there are substantial improvements that can happen within given resources. But with additional resources, in, India tends to be one of the most privatized healthcare system and we spend very little on public services overall. I mean, contrary to perceptions that India is socialist, when, when I look at the US, it's, it's a socialist mecca in terms of just how much the government spends in various welfare programs. Um, so there is a huge uh, avenue for improvement with increasing resources, but also improvement in how programs function. Um, what is also interesting to me is that there are quite a lot of people who have invest a lot of time and effort in improving state capacity, 
um, through trainings and through creating um, mm -hmm. beautifully carpeted offices and air conditioned offices and other facilities. Um, I think it's, it is important to improve capacity, but if you see dramatic improvements that happen in state after state, most of them have happened with exactly the same resources and exactly the same set of uh, people who are functioning, but with a different set of pulls and pressures that make them function. Um, so in that sense, um, I feel like state capacity, while we should think about it, we should also be uh, cautious about not investing all our efforts in that. Um, and finally, if you think about ref uh, the reform of various um, programs, there's a huge emphasis today on the use of experts and on experiments in order to find out what works and what does not. Along with experts and experiments, I think there's a huge role for empowerment because it is when people are able to come back and say, this doesn't work for me, that programs ultimately will start functioning much better. Um, this is very contentious today because there's on one hand um, a set of advocates who want to embed rights in various programs because embedding rights actually embeds people who fight for it in the locality. Whereas people who want to think about it from a more economistic perspective um, have generally argued against a rights-based approach to providing programs. So it's, a, it's another debate uh, to which I think I should be able to talk to. Coming to academic literature, I think this work kind of um, supports the work of people like uh, Amartya Sen and Jean Dres, who have, among other things, argued that in states where you have greater freedoms for women are also the states that tend to uh, deliver public services well. They have tentatively argued that uh, this could be because women are now able to, let's say, approach a school teacher or a public health service and then bring their demands, uh, but they have not quite documented it in detail. So my uh, ethnographic work hopefully provides greater uh, trust to that work ha and it also kind of argues as they do that human agency is the fundamental progress of uh, um, force of progressive change and not so much investments or other factors so there's an onus on human agency in that sense within the comparative politics literature as i argued earlier um, there are people like atul kohli and uh, um, patrick heller who have argued that the only way to get progressive uh, change is by having left of center mobilization um, they're mainly talking about communist parties so I do um, debunk that um, argument. In fact, in Atul Kohli's uh, recent book on India, there's a very interesting moment where he's, he starts by looking at the states that have been most successful in reducing poverty over the last 30 years. The top states happens to be Kerala, the second top is uh, Tamil Nadu, and the third is West Bengal. And then in explaining how this came about, he somehow skips from Kerala to West Bengal and ignores Tamil Nadu in between. And there's a curious paragraph in between which uh, describes the politics of Tamil Nadu because he, in some sense, follows uh, Weberian classification and has classified the identity politics in Tamil Nadu as a uh, neo-patrimonial mechanism. So he says the state leaders tend to wreck the state economies and uh, they inherently don't contribute to human will, I mean, creating progressive agenda, whereas somehow it has been muted by people's mobilization. That's a very weak argument against a strong claim that you make that the state has been the most among the most successful in reducing poverty. So I think um, it does talk to people uh, like Heller and Kohli in terms of understanding progressive change through identity politics, apart from other means, uh, and going beyond uh, um, looking at uh, class-focused uh, mobilization. And there are others like Narendra Subramaniam who have argued that uh, expansion of public services happen mainly through populism. And, and he basically says that when you have conditions that um, where you can create a large clientelistic um, um, following, then populism might happen, and then those states will tend to produce public services in a large way. What I would point to this is that maybe there are political pressures that can be uh, brought about by this uh, phenomenon, but unless people are able to assert themselves, uh, in many cases, um, they may not even be able to access public services because they have explicit bans on girls from accessing schools and from um, people of lower caste from accessing schools and other facilities. So you may provide the facilities, but if people are not able to access it, populism has no role there. So unless there is assertion at the grassroots, um, one, uh, your populism will take you nowhere. And more importantly, the process of improvement of these facilities by the constant feedback from people in different positions will not happen. So thus, if we have to understand why <coughs> things function well in a particular place, populism, again, is a fairly weak argument to help us understand that. So I'll stop here. Um, the book, like I said, um, does not deal so much with the process of um, constant iterative changes that happen, but it focuses a lot more on the politics and how people organized and what were the major political and social changes that happened over a period of time. So I'll be happy to talk about it um, if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Perfect.